we allowed fracture to be essentially creation of new surfaces. In this basic theory, it's really new surface energy. Then we saw that in real materials, then fracture energy is going to be much more, and it's going to be an energy cost which is quite larger, which is irreversible. So now today we're going to move to soft and dissipative materials, which are both things which are very bad for fracture mechanics, because we want it to be linear, so it will not be elastically linear, and we want it to be uh, dissipative only in a small region around crack tips, and now in polymer system you can have dissipation somewhere, everywhere. So that's very bad for fracture mechanics. Now let's see what we can do. Uh, <coughs> so then the aim will be somehow to understand this kind of system when you're peeling soft adhesives, you, you don't see the fracture, the crack front anymore. <laughs> you have these large fibrils and instabilities also intact. If you look with the microscope, you see some object like this where you can recon recognize some of the fringes which Herbert have been showing. Then you can have la very large strains and now the undeformed shape of this would be a, a, a sharp crack. Now you see the crack is wide open, it's very difficult to analyze. And this is a shear test where in shear you should have no such kind of cavities or things, there's no pressure. And still we see cavities and thing bad things there, so there's many things to understand. So um, we're going to have a little trip, I don't know how far we can go. Uh, we'll start by thinking it easy, so no dissipation, we'll just make material very soft and see what happens to elastocapillarity, which is the core of fracture mechanics, meaning how do surfaces interact with the elasticity? Can surfaces change the shape of objects? And then surfaces are also the kind of energy which are needed for fracture, so that will be a very important concept. We'll do it by thinking some example by soft contact between uh, solids, cavity expansion, uh, then see how this changes this paradigm of defect problem because if defects are blunting, we'll see we, are, we can be more flow tolerant if we want in soft materials. And make a link with these shape instabilities, which Herbert has been showing, how do they affect the bonding mechanism. And then if we have time, we'll look in some research topic about fracture and adhesion of uh, uh, soft materials with dissipative materials, and try to see some work we're trying to do to relate fracture in different kind of tests, like peel, tack, and shear, even if fracture mechanic is not working anymore. Okay, so that's what we would like to do. Uh, the first thing I would like to say is that there is an important message before starting, which is it's not normal to have uh, large strains in adhesion, indeed, because uh, if you saw yesterday, if we had um, fracture energy and elasticity coming from enthalpy, which means interatomic uh, interaction, then we couldn't be able to have strains larger than 10%, because we would take, if we have to take atoms apart, then as, loose as, much, uh, as long as we make uh, one atomic distance, then the interaction is lost, the object is broken. Okay, there's no way. So soft sol solids, they're not, uh, they cannot be normal enthalpic material, and here I totally agree with uh, <laughs> Professor Grosberg, we need entropy <laughs> to be soft here, and that's exactly what uh, uh, Professor Rubinstein showed us yesterday, in most soft material, like here I take an elastomer, elasticity is given by entropy, it's not given by enthalpy. We are not taking atoms apart, we are moving there, reorganizing them, and we generally have a network which keeps elasticity somehow, with covalent bonds and crosslinks, but we in as long as we are not tight, we have a lot of freedom to reorganize things, so elasticity can be very soft, but uh, we need also to have uh, elasticity and uh, cohesion to have different origin. We want cohesion to remain stiff. And indeed, cohesion remains mostly enthalpic, because in the end of this, we still have to break bonds, covalent bonds, which is uh, enthalpic. Or if we are in adhesion, we still have to separate uh, van der Waals interaction, for example, and this is still enthalpic. So we keep having the same kind of co cohesion as before, because uh, this makes no difference in van der Waals interaction if you make two solids interact when they're stiff or when they're soft. It's the same kind of energy. It's the same kind of stress, which is quite high. But when you try to stretch on them, if you have uh, entropic elasticity, then you, it can be very soft, softer than cohesion, and then you can stretch very large before breaking. 
Okay, so that's very important before starting. And then now, uh, concerning, uh, so concerning elastic capillarity, so now we're trying to see how do surface tension couple to material, which didn't happen in soft solid. In, soft in stiff solids, to have new surfaces, we had to break it. New surfaces were new s fracture surfaces. While in a soft solid, the shape can change and the surface can change too. So can this couple together? And now, since it's early morning, we are starting to do some stretching energies, a, a stretching exercise, which is not physical, which will be mind stretching, which I mean, we're not solving any problem, we're just thinking about what would happen if, what would happen if, and you're working, okay? <laughs> so that will wake you up, essentially. Maybe not all arguments will be exactly good, but I think that will less really let you understand what we are talking about. So the first question is, now I take an object, I make an egg of a soft gel, Will surface tension make it spherical like for a liquid? For a liquid, this would always happen. Okay? You know, the surface is it reduced if we go from an egg to a sphere with the same volume. Remember that most soft materials, they are soft, but they are incompressible. So we should somehow, when they change the shape, we can think in a similar way to fluids. So can this happen? No. Who would know? The question is, if I get an egg, soft egg, out of a mold, will surface tension make it spherical? It's not a real egg. It's a very soft egg. Huh? Can you do that? It depends on size. Okay, that's a nice point because indeed the point is here. Uh, no matter, we'll not do an exact calculation, but elastic energies must be integrated, are proportional to Young modulus and must be integration over the volume of this, which is R cubed. While the surface is proportional to surface tension, and, uh, I but it is proportional to R square. So, which means that now, if we get this egg being smaller and smaller and smaller, then at some moment the energy cost to change the shape will be less and less. Also, the surface gain will be less, but this will go, will decrease faster. So there will be a scale, if you make a ratio between the two of these, where the energy cost will become lower than the surface energy gain. And so it will be interesting to do that. If you are below, if you make this ratio, you obtain that the critical size is gamma over E, which you already saw yesterday, we call it elastocapillary length. And now I say capillary because gamma is really a surface tension. Okay? And so here we have this question of size, which is very general in elastocapillarity. When we are smaller than the size, then generally it will be you will gain more energy by changing shape and reducing surfaces than the energy you pay for deforming your object, because this object now is strained. Okay? It's not like a liquid. For a liquid, there is no cost, so it will always happen. For a solid, solid it will help if it's small enough. Okay? You can also think at this, and it's useful, in terms of Laplace pressure, like in fluids. Because you know, if you, now you have a solid with the surface tension around, then this will make a pressure inside your material. Difference of pressure. Now here, the pressure is homogeneous, but here, you have a larger curvature here, so a larger pressure here than there. And this can make material move up to a moment where the pressure is the same everywhere, and now it's a sort of hydrodynamic equilibrium. Yeah? That's exactly what we are saying, but uh, there is some elastic energy. Uh, but it will not, the, I mean, everything is governed by energy minimization. So somehow, we minimize surface, and we don't care about the fact that we increase elastic energy because it's, sm it's small, but it exists. Okay? Exactly. So that's the first point. Second point, quite similar. Now we make a cube, soft, very soft cube. We unmold it, we put it in a, detri in a petri dish. What do you expect to see? Once again, does it stay square? Will it become sphere, like I told before? Will it squish on the bottom?
now your mind is uh, increasing, is heating up and is increasing number of possible before you only thought of B. <laughs> of course, we already saw it depends on the size. If it's small, it will make A. If it's large, it makes B. And why should it make C? Because of gravity. There was no gravity in previous examples. Now we switch on gravity. And indeed, uh, that's exactly what happened. It's a little, this line, each line is for one of these. If we, took about, if we look at capillarity, if it's small, it's a sphere. Then this we can predict. Then we switch on gravity. And gravity is proportional to the mass, which is the, the cube, but also to the eight. So for power four. So now gravity is stronger at larger scale. So if you go even bigger, uh, then the cube is splashing. Okay? And if you want to minimize energy, you want it flat. But you also can consider the competition between gravity and surface tension alone. And this could make that, for example, here on the border, you could have meniscus going up <coughs> below the capillary length, which you know in fluids. This number is common in fluids, OK? But now you have three numbers. So you have to deal with these three numbers and see if your object is small and big in front of one or the other. Uh, this would be sort of super hydrophobic here, but we'll, we'll deal it in the next slide. This is was very simple. It's just to we activate things one after the other. Now there was no adhesion. Then we'll switch adhesion on. Sorry? So typical numbers, I can tell you about uh, gamma over E. Gamma over E, now gamma, if it's a surface tension, is more or less 0.1 joule per square meter in most materials. Okay. Now if you take E, the stiff solid is gigapascal, this makes angstrom, so you'll never see that. If you take an elastomer, then gamma over E will become 100 nanometer, it's, it's uh, small. But if you take a hydrogel, one kilopascal, then this becomes 0.1 millimeter. You can see with some nice glasses. And if you make even smaller gels, which people are doing, then that can become larger. Okay? And I show experimental pictures about this. Uh, uh, yeah, for example, this was done by, published by Herbert. This is the gel which is in, in water, so now it's iso-supported. There's no gravity in the gel. Then if you make the water go out, then the gel is splashing on the bottom, so uh, gravity is, is winning. And the nice thing is that if you, take, if you put water back again, it's not remaining there, so it's not a dead gel. Uh, it, it, it is elastically going back to the initial shape. So that was really elastic effect. And it didn't, if you don't believe it, you can do it on the seaside. You just take your revenge over jellyfish. <laughs> and it takes them out of water, <laughs> and, and they're being gravitally, gravitally splashed. Good. <laughs> Another nice example was done by Serge Morat, which tried to unmold this cylinder. He hoped it would become a sphere, but it's very difficult, because indeed this elastocapillary length scale, I told, this is one millimeter, and it's less than one millimeter, even for salt gel. So you don't, it doesn't become a sphere. But you see that the border, which were sharp, they become rounded, okay? So these things doesn't have to happen in the whole object. It happens below the scale of the elastocapillary length, and it can, you can see here that it, this sharp object becomes rounded, okay? Due to a local reduction of surface tension, which was very nice. Next example. So we recover what we did yesterday, this adhesive contact, but this real small thing changing, now the sphere is soft and the substrate is stiff. As long as the contact area is small, there's no change, because we consider that uh, the surface, uh, that the elastic energy was contained in a volume of A cube, and it's the same if it is uh, in the sphere or on the bottom. But if the area of contact becomes larger, then it's not the same thing anymore, and now what we are going to do is to try and predict what happens. So there's no external force, so there is an initial uh, area of contact, spontaneous contact. You can also see here, I made a small scale, uh, this deviation, which are elastocapillary effects. Now, the, ex the exercise is what happens now if, if we have very soft sphere. So now we have a sort of DNA gel sphere with 10 kilopascal stuff. What, what happens? How does this change? Where do you go? If you go so soft that you can forget about elasticity, what do you expect? Sort of flat. It could, but now you inserted adhesion, okay, which is what you asked before. And indeed, uh, it will not go flat completely because at some moment, uh, if you increase this area, you will decrease this external surface, okay? 
So at some moment, external surface is not going to be happy, and it's going to stop you. And indeed, what you find is the same that you would find in liquids. You will stop when the contact angle reaches this Young equation, which is really an energy minimization equation, like yesterday. If this line moves left or right, you gain this, you lose this, and, uh, you, and you find a minimum where everything is right. I'll get you. And this is represented by representing these energies as forces per unit line, and then making this sort of vector diagram, where here you're forced to move on the stiff substrate, the tripod line here, and here this tension is oriented tangent to the surface, and you make an equilibrium of horizontal forces. The vertical ones are not equilibrized, but you have a stiff substrate which can resist somehow. Question. Here there's no gravity now. It's small enough, but you always have gravity. But I mean, now you understand what gravity does. Let's focus on elasticity and surface tension. I say elasticity is so weak that surface tension does everything. But you have three surface tensions. Okay? Yeah, exactly. When it's very soft. And the point is that now, remember about what we did yesterday about adhesion. In fluid, we think about these three surface tensions. But indeed, uh, this would be sort of adhesion and two open cracks. Okay? So now this is gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 1, 2. So you can write it like in terms of this and relate this to Dupre adhesion energy like yesterday. And then you go into some little complex stuff like uh, now if you have a full, this is partial contact, which means that if you relate this, you have a negative spreading parameter. I will not explain it again. It's fluid physics. And if it's positive, then you will have perfect wetting, so it will not stop and it will spread. Okay? That's just... Uh, imaginary somehow, but uh, it's interesting, and there is some experiments to confirm some of this. Uh, now let's do a very similar thing. Now the sphere is rigid, and the substrate is soft, very soft. So I told you, if the area of contact is small, it's the same, but if the area of contact is not small, it's not the same. Try to imagine. Anyway, it's not easy to say, so I'll show. The, the sphere will sink up to the moment where the contact angle is satisfied. So now we have equilibrium of these three things. And again, we can only move the tripod line along the sphere. Okay? And this happens for a small sphere, once again. And uh, there has been... Uh, mm, no, no, before there has been, I show this, which is now the very bad one. Very soft sphere on very soft substrate. Okay? Ah, bad. What's happening? Try to imagine. Now you know the trick. Think about fluids. What's happening if elasticity is not important? And what happens in fluids? Okay. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. The drop is doing something like that. It's like when you put oil in your soup and then you're seeing the sort of lenses. And now you see the three lines are not a line anymore because the, the object can deform. And uh, some people have been proposing that here you would recover this sort of Neumann triangle where the sum of these three uh, vectors would equilibrate. Uh, and then people have tried to see that, and it's not that bad. This is a case done by Parks, where here you have a soft uh, a liquid, so a real liquid, then a soft solid here and vapor here. And then it is, it's not doing this, but at the scale below gamma over E, then it's doing something which looks like this. Okay. At larger scale, elasticity will be important. Okay? So these things happen somehow with very soft elastic solids close to tripod lines. How close? A distance gamma over E. Okay? So that's just to help mine to go into that. And then now if we put gravity back, then strange thing can happen like <laughs> Now, not only the sphere could like to go in because of surface tension, but then if you have gravity, then uh, the soft solid is very incapable of uh, sustaining uh, the ball in small uh, deformation. So the ball is clearly going in, and then the solid is closing around the ball, so you have full adhesion and you're going down. But then when you're going down, you're building up more and more elastic energy on a larger volume, which depends on depth. Okay? So you will reach a critical depth, 
where there is enough elastic energy to sustain gravity. Okay? So this is what's called elastic buoyancy, and it's a nice experiment from uh, uh, Serge Morat. Okay, uh, it's stretching mine uh, somehow. <laughs> Different than JK air contact we did. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the point is that now we are imagining a soft solid. Soft solid doesn't relax. It's pure elasticity. There's no time there. This is happening. This is staying forever. Okay? Then we'll do viscoelastic stuff. But keep it simple in the beginning. Okay? <laughs> or then you're going to explode before the end of the class. Yeah. You shouldn't. You are never in the situation where the contact area is small. So when you read papers of that, doing soft contact on soft materials using AFM, just think about materials you choose. Yeah. And think that the, crack, the, the tip of the AFM is 10 nanometer radius, which is below all of this. So very probably your soft material is rising up around your tip. And, uh, you should think about it. <laughs> you should make this picture. That's what I want you uh, like this to do, and uh, these kind of things. Change your mental picture about what could happen. Then it's maybe not exactly that, but it's going to happen something similar, let's say. Okay? Sorry? Uh, you can, but now it's not in the ingredients uh, of the model, so in the model you can't. In reality, it didn't happen. But it could, of course. And then at some moment, it's like wire cutting, then you are cutting your material. Uh, okay, now let's change uh, kind of uh, exercise. Now we're talking about cavities. Okay, let's start with the bubble in water. You have bubble water, water evaporates, it sets up a constant vapor pressure, and it has a surface tension. So will it inflate or not? This you should know by fluid physics. Remember? Laplace pressure, yes, but does it inflate or not? Is pressure enough to increase the surface? Yes, it depends, once again. <laughs> the answer is easy, it's always, it depends. You say it depends, and I say, yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, it depends, because the work depends on square, on cube of the sphere, while the surface is square. So once again, if the sphere is too little, no way. The work will not be enough, and surface is winning. It will collapse. But then if you are larger than this minimum uh, size, then uh, it's easier. The work will be larger and larger, like in Griffith crack somehow. And the surface tension will always will increase lower, so you will inflate. And that's why in Champagne, we, you need some external defects on your glass to start bubbles, because if bubbles would start from zero, then they would shrink. You need something to create a bubble which is larger than this, and then it, it can go. That's why here you don't see it in this picture, but generally bubbles always come on a line from somewhere, and at the bottom of somewhere there is a defect in glass or something like that. don't know exactly what is it, but you need heterogeneous nucleation by something which makes the initial defect being larger than this. But anyway, you see you have a minimum size. Break bond? Uh, that's a fluid here. Outside the open fluid, it's not soft solid. Uh, no, it's the gas bubble in water. So anyway, you break bonds, but bonds are dynamic, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, uh, now it's soft solid. <laughs> but now there's no pressure. So we, we make a cavity, and now the surface tension. So I, it will not inflate because there's no pressure, okay? Uh, but... If it collapses, now surface tension is winning, okay? It, surface tension would like the bubble to collapse, like before. 
but now there is elasticity. So will it collapse? It depends, yeah, on what? <laughs> Elast that's the same as before, elastic capillary line length. Because anyway, the elastic energy to, s to squish it would be proportional to the cube, with bad functions, and surface like this. So it's always the same. If the, if the cavity is very small, then surface tension will collapse it, even if you have a solid behind. Sorry? Yeah, certainly it would do bad things and cramples and bad things. But let's say the beginning of the story would be it starts uh, collapsing. Then the end of the story can be very complex. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, this would happen. So new fact in your life, it, it can collapse due to surface tension. Then if a bubble is huge, then it would cost too much energy. So it will not. Okay? So small bubble, sub-millimeter in a gel. Uh, then now we put the pressure in, okay? So we put some pressure inside, and now, you, but there's no surface tension, okay? So it's just pressure against elasticity, okay? Can I inflate a bubble in an elastomer by putting pressure in? That's the question. Yes. Then, of course, uh, not any pressure. <laughs> it depends. And, uh, but here is different, because the volume, the work, would increase as cube, but the elastic energy also would increase as cube. So there is no characteristic length if you just do it like that. It's just if the pressure is light, larger than elastic modulus, then you, in principle you can. Okay? Because this is the next slide. <laughs> Now, you, do s you must, when you have a complex problem, you must segment it into smaller, simpler problems which you may can understand, and then you put them together. That's the way, or uh, it's too difficult. Okay, so no surface tension here, that would be. And by nice, exact calculation, you can show that this could happen in principle for P larger than 5, 6 of E. So th there's if you do correct mechanics, which Herbert can do, you would find similar results. Not all of them, but uh, this works. So now, <laughs> now you have surface tension. Now, now you have pressure, surface tension, and elasticity. Okay. So now, is it going with respect to the previous one? Is it going to be harder or easier to inflate the bubble by pressure? It now it depends on the size. It should, at least under some condition. <laughs> huh? Easier. Who says easier? One, two, no, one. Who says harder? Ah, winning. In fact, harder because you must increase the surface. So it's going to be harder. You need more energy. There's nothing to say. Okay. And. Now, a little more line, but it's always the same lines. You have work, you have elastic energy, you have surface tension, but now you combine them into total energy, so the work gets into negative things, and you want total energy to decrease. And now you can take pressure this way, and you have that pressure should be larger than Young modulus, but also larger than Laplace pressure. Okay? So you must fight against elasticity and against surface tension. Then, if surface tension is very small, you get into previous problem. Then, if elastic modulus is very small, then you get into the other problem of collapsing. So, if uh, now it depends on size. So, if, if the size is very small, it's maybe going to collapse, or it, you will need a larger pressure, very large pressure to inflate. But if the size is large, then you don't care anymore about surface tension, and it's just enough to have a pressure larger than Young modulus, which is experimentally observed. You generate, as long as pressure becomes larger than uh, modulus, you have bubble inflation. But for small bubbles, you need more pressure. That's that. Then there is not a perfect experimental agreement on all of these problems. We'll see why. But that's a good guide. Okay? There should be some size effect when you have surface tension in. Okay? And you can interpret this by getting this left and say that the difference pressure between the pressure you apply and Laplace pressure should be larger than elastic modulus. That's another way of seeing, which is the real pressure who comes into the elastic solid. Uh, 
at smaller scale, you need larger pressure because air is going small. And then what are modular scale? When this becomes more important than this is when air is smaller than gamma over E. OK? <laughs> yeah. No, the point is that your, your, your champagne was kept in equilibrium under very high pressure. So now when you open the bottle, it's out of equilibrium, so it's going to boil somehow. But you need, in order to, to make gas go out, you need heterogeneous nucleation. So my question is, can you have a bottle in an elastic champagne? In the what? In an elastic champagne. Yeah, and uh, Constantino has done them. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but you need to put a huge pressure inside before, okay. and then you open your bottle, <laughs> and then it's uh, making bubbles. Yeah, you should call the paper the solid, the elastic champagne. That would be a good title. Yeah, that's a very good match. And you want a real champagne? That would increase the impact of the paper. <laughs> that's <a> very good. <laughs> <laughs> that should increase your number of crazy ideas of things to be done. Anyway, so this was pressure, surface tension, and uh, young modulus. Now let's do something a little different, which is we get the pressure out, but we add the negative traction, isotropic traction, elsewhere. So like now we're inside the tuck test, inside something where you put a negative pressure on your object in an adhesive or something, and you want to see if your cavity is inflating against surface tension. And indeed, mechanically, the system is identical to previous one, because as uh, Herbert has been showing, if the material is incompressible, you can add an arbitrary pressure, and this arbitrary negative pressure will cancel the pressure in and put the pressure outside. So it mechanically, it is the same, so I don't ask you the question. It's the same equation, I just copied. Same equation, you need this elastic energy now to inflate uh, the bubble, you pay this energy and you gain some work at the boundaries. Because differently than Griffith crack, where I told you the boundaries is nothing, now if the material is incompressible, if you make a, uh, a volume here, you must get the same volume out. So you will have the same work in the periphery by pressure as the volume of the bubble. So now you know. So that's why for incompressible material only, it is the same to add the pressure everywhere. Okay, so this is the same. So now you learn about cavitation, simple way of cavitation. Ca cavitation. So you put a bubble. It's not cavitation. It cavi cavity exists. Will it inflate or not under a negative pressure? And now it's the same answer. So if the bubble is big, bigger than elastoadhesive length, then it, when you apply a negative pressure larger than Young modulus, it will inflate. And then if it's small, then you should apply a larger pressure, okay, to induce cavity. And uh, can I make it even more complex? No, I'm now I'm making the link with what I told yesterday. So this is, uh, forget about everything which is out of the boxes. This is the equation yesterday for uh, growth of this crack, and you see somehow it's sort of bubble, this crack, and it's, you apply this, tension far away, and this sort of bubble is growing or not, if it's large enough. Okay, it's very similar, somehow. Yeah. If you take the previous slide, you can have a cavitation because the initial bubble would be below the Yeah, this wouldn't allow a spontaneous cavitation without an heterogeneous... So uh, yeah, that's uh, that a very complex subject, but I mean, in most material, this must start from defects of material. No, not bubble, but I mean, 
Uh, you should argue there is some sort of defect. You can argue there's Griffith's crack, but it's probably not true. But probably, that is, this is a research topic where very probably some defect in the network will progressively induce damage up to have something which becomes larger than the size. Huh? Yeah. No matter how small it is, you want you have to have re really the spectacular event smaller than Yeah, yeah. But s which means that very probably you must damage your network up to such a size where E is vanishing inside and then uh, you can do but I mean this is research very very good question which uh, if I had the answer I would publish that. Okay, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really important. We have projects on this and uh, we we still yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, once again, uh, and Constantino and Etienne Bartel, they're working on that. And, uh, that's a very nice problem. But what is the origin of cavities in the beginning? That's a very tough problem. Yeah, but it's better to talk at the posters. <laughs> Let's keep simple. <laughs> okay. Simple. Uh, more simple. Uh, yeah, I was saying, okay, this is essentially the same as I was saying before by ingredients, but there is a difference. The difference is that in linear elastic crack fracture mechanics, the crack is not a sphere, it's flat. Okay? Here it was a slit crack, so in two dimensions, but you can think it about the penny crack around. That would be exactly the same equation, because now this volume would be C cubed, the surface would be C squared, it's still one power difference, still you would get that you have this critical length. Uh, and so it's, it's like a penny crack which would expand or not. But the scaling is different. The scale is not just gamma over E, because now, exactly, this is not a sphere. Uh, and, uh, so s s and also, you don't have this work on the boundaries. But let's use it to understand cavities better. Now, I'll use this again, and this is the exercise now. If you take this equation here, and now you put the pressure here, it's essentially the same. Uh, we put the pressure everywhere. And uh, I write this equation in a different way, which is now P, the pressure to inflate divided Young modulus, is the square root of gamma over EC. So this is the equation. The same equation is here, rewritten. Epsilon, now it would be the typical deformation, which I evaluated uh, nowhere, but it's uh, the opening delta divided by the length of the crack is more or less a strain. So in the beginning, we copied this, OK? But indeed, if you consider the pressure over Young modulus, the stress over Young modulus is more or less the strain you see. In the previous case, epsilon was small, which means the pressure is small in front of E, which means that gamma over EC must be small too, which means that the crack should be larger than elastoadhesive length. This is gamma over E, OK? Now, here I call elastoadhesive length because now it's fracture, it's not surface tension, and fracture can, is new surfaces to be broken, and we call it gamma, which can be larger than the small gamma, which is surface tension. Okay? So just think that there's two people now, not just one. Okay? This is larger than this, but they're quite similar, but not exactly the same. So here you, you must create fracture, but anyway, the equations are exactly the same. So now we have this and we put pressure. What happens? I'll start. If we are in the good condition of linear elastic fracture mechanic, which means a long crack, a long crack, so now pressure is low, you can start a long crack with the low pressure, so OK, the crack is going to propagate. And you see, you have surface tension here, but then you have new surfaces created in red, which is gamma. You increase crack length, OK? New surfaces created. This we know. Then now, if C becomes smaller than this, we can know what happens. Because now, pressure will become larger and larger, then it can overcome Young modulus, and then strain can become larger than 1. Okay? Which means you can go there. Okay? So if a crack is very small, smaller than elasto elastoadhesive length, this one, then the crack will tend to blunt before it propagates. So it becomes a circle. And you see there's no red. It's just against surface tension now. And uh, then what happens next is more complicated. Yeah. Yeah, but I, uh, I said, 
Ya. Uh, P was sigma. It was the loading, the remote loading. And indeed, you apply the remote loading perpendicular to the crack is very efficient. If you add another loading like this, it doesn't do nothing. But it's nice because now we have a pressure and it's good for soft solid because now it makes a bubble. So, it's <laughs> so here it's an elastic opening of the crack. Then what happens next is more complex. Will this inflate or will this break? Exactly like Michael was also asking. Do we need to break bonds next? And that there's two possibilities, yeah. Either this bubble inflates because now the pressure is larger than Young modulus. It could inflate without breaking. Okay? But it can also break and inflate because of new fracture surface, which means that this, the undeformed condition of this is that. The red parts are straight. And the point is that now when you make experiments, you see a sphere in the two cases, so you don't know what's happening. Okay, so that has been an origin of many mistakes, and also here there's nice uh, research of uh, Constantino. I don't know if it's published already, by putting uh, mechanophores on uh, on this material, then he can see if you have new fra new fracture or not, and then when when he unloads samples, you can see where was the new broken bones. Okay, published. Some is published. Yeah, yeah. Then we will, we will be uh, have more soon. Yeah, that's the beginning of the story. The problem is that yeah, this material is indeed a network. So if you stretch it, you, you have to break bonds at some moment. You cannot just stretch it forever. And then the problem is that if you st start stretching it, if it was a perfect Neookian material with no physics behind, it would inflate in an unstable way. But that's not physically possible. And indeed, when you stretch the material, then you have strain hardening, which I've been showing. And then ah, this stops somehow the growth, so this bubble will become stable, and then once it's stable, then probably you need to break. But that's complex. You see, it depends on the material, it depends on toughness, it depends on many ingredients. The top is not, the top is not the so here I didn't put any equation because there is no. This, that is this, think it about scenarios. Then what happens, really, you need more ingredients to know which one will happen. It can be either or, and I don't say if it's small, if it's large. It really depends on more subtle question of which kind of network are you breaking. Uh, and that's why y you need to put probes, you need to check things better. So that, but it's important to think that once you see a sphere, you don't know if it was inflation or fracture, because the two look the same. Huh? If it is a fracture, if, if the surface is this, but it blunts, then uh, you, you see a bubble. Do people say that uh, elastic of uh, LPA depends on strain? This is more nonlinear effect. Ex exactly. The point is that uh, if you increase strain, then you have all strain hardening stuff. So you change the Th This is just the initial modulus, so this will never tell you what happens in large strain. It just tells you what happened in the beginning. Then you have to do more hypotheses, which I will not do because I just want to stay there. But uh, I just want to open problems, and you will close it. Yeah. But here, the, the, there is no air because I'm putting traction outside, so this is sort of vacuum inside. Then if you wait, then some diffusion of gas can go in and I don't know what, but I, yeah, for the moment, if you do it fast, you will create va uh, vacuum bubbles in the beginning, okay? With surface tension and fracture energy. Oof, okay. 
it's fracture energy, which is larger than surface energy, because there will be some sort of dissipation mechanism, which at least in elastomer is stretching chain and breaking them. This takes 100 times more than just breaking the surface. So even if you have uh, elasticity everywhere, that's why I put it here. You can have this large gamma in elastomers and in soft gels either, because this can be much more than surface when you break new bonds. But you should not forget that when you open a crack, there is also surface tension. Weak, but existing. So if your material is really very brittle and gamma goes close to small gamma, then the two will couple in a bad way, maybe. What is the ratio of two gamma to uh, There is, I mean, what do you mean by ductile here? Because um, the, the it's just elastic model here. There's no flow in this model, it's j but then it's very interesting to consider that. Uh, the point is that this is 0.1. This, if you have a network like in, in it, it can go to 100 joule just to stretch and break bonds. In the typical network is about one. What, what does gamma for the uh, it depends on what it, it, it is. Uh, the lower limit is 0.1. The capital gamma, the capital gamma you make, if you take an elastomer, it can be 50 joule, but if you take an hydrogel, then it can be one or less. Uh, it, it depends on how many chains you have in your system. Yeah, and and uh, for an elastic system, then you can have dissipation, but for an elastic system, it depends on the density of chain and the length of chain. Yeah, then there can be then there can be more and more pervert material. <laughs> Point one is the minimum because it's surface tension. You anyway, even if you make a soft hydrogel, you have to break water, so you uh, you should create surface of water. Very brittle hydrogels are 0.1. Okay, many complex stuff. Let's see if it's over. Uh, almost. In fact, this is just to see that if the cavity happens on an adhesive interface, then you have the same problem. You have a, a penny crack, sorry for roughness, but roughness at least. You have a penny crack here, and uh, you have surface tension, and you have fracture tension to propagate the crack. Then now you apply this uh, stress here, which turns out to be a pressure when you are in a confined environment, and then it will start to blow, to blow uh, without propagating, and then there's once again, you can choose between propagating the interface with gamma or inflating without propagating the interface, which is uh, small gamma. Okay. And now let's see that these things really happen. And these are tack experiments in uh, soft adhesives, so it's not very elastic. But anyway, forget about elasticity. Think about the scenarios now. Then we'll think, talk about uh, dissipation. So you are very confined, so if you want to separate this punch from the substrate with your soft material here, you will have very strong negative pressure and you're going to do cavities and strings which uh, have been showed a little, but let's see this nice experiment where it's difficult to see what you see because what you see is the soft material, everything is invisible, so you are inside sort of the soft material and you will see eventually something happening. Now it's starting to open, and now you see these cavities, and then they propagate and the interface, and then coalesce together. So now the object is broken. What did we do is to take this punch up. You can see that something is happening in the meniscus around. The camera is on a 44... The, it's made in a way that everything is invisible except your soft material which you are inside. So you're like inside and you open and uh, uh, these bubbles are creating but you see that they are propagating then they coalesce together and then the object is dead. Okay? I show it again. So you see that in these borders move. Uh, 45 degrees. It's not me, it's Yamaguchi. You see there is fingering on the borders and then uh, there is cavities and then they propagate, okay? Then there is a different one where surface defects now don't propagate, they become spheres, okay? 
That's the other case. And you see on the borders you have some fingering, but now you have a lot of cavities. And since they don't propagate, now you see that you lose this flow tolerance. The Griffith crack would break everything. Previous case, they will propagate and join together. Now if you have this, now the structure is still working. You're full of bubbles, and then bubbles become uh, fringes, uh, fibrils, but you're still in a structural integrity somehow, which shows that you can be tolerant to these flows, if before one break, other one break, and then pro each one of them is relaxing pressure around it, and then at some level there is almost no more pressure, and now you can stretch fibrils in a sort of nice uniaxial way, sort of. And uh, you also saw on the border there was some starting of fingering. And now if you take uh, a smaller size of your patch, then you will have less pressure in the middle and fingering is going to win. So now when you open this, you have fingers winning before you make cavities, okay? And also these fingers is sort of bubbles which from inside grow in. It's elastic capillary effect, quite similar somehow. And there was another nice experiment. Here is the inverse situation, another analogy with fluids. Now the solid is outside, you are between two plates, and you with this, you push a liquid inside, and you want to inflate this 2D bubble, okay? In fluids, you would have Safman taylor instabilities and fingering, and in solids, something similar happens too. Now it's inflating in a symmetric way, and then one finger, three fingers, quite nice. But they are elastic, they can go back if you unload, okay? So you see there's lots of similar analogies, and that's an elastic effect. And you see that the tripod line didn't move. You have a sort of dark line here. So this is happening in the bulk. It's flowing in like, like bubbles. Now if you load too much, as you asked before, uh, maybe it's next time. Here, if you load too much, then you're going to break it. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry? In the previous one. Yeah, uh, uh, is the size, the confinement of your tack test. I mean, if you are small, then the pressure drop is parabolic, uh, the pressure build up is parabolic, and you will get to uh, somehow, um, you, don't cam you don't make cavities, you make fingers. If it's very large, very confined, then yeah, it's no, it's confinement, uh, geometric confinement, exactly. Um, the wavelengths and. I know that the lengths depend on, on loading, but in this case they were sort of stable. But yeah, but and I, I the distance is invariant. You can model it to be related somehow to the thickness of the layer, while then the the the, the, the amplitude and the other geometry depend on loading. You you load more and you inflate and then. This, ah, uh, this will probably be related to. <laughs> Laplace pressure, yes, certainly. Uh, but it's in 2D. I don't want to say it's stupid things, so I prefer to, say, to think about <laughs> before answering. And uh, uh, concerning, so you saw that you... Uh, yes, question. Uh, it's a soft gel, uh, maybe I don't know exactly, maybe it's polyacrylamide or something like that. Uh. Why it's stable? Yeah. So is this because uh, uh, it is energetically more favorable to form these fingers compared to what uh, energy it would require to uh, inflate the whole bubble? Yeah, the point is, is this the answer is similar to what Herbert has been shown yesterday, is that if you want to expand it altogether, 
you should do it uh, in a sort of plain strain way that would cost a lot of energy while I if you do like that uh, no it's not the answer is not the good this is not good I this would happen if, if you open it if you would be opening opening it then this would be the answer but if you do like this is more like uh, the the answer is more like a transposition of Safman Taylor instabilities which is a uh, somehow, w once you do this kind of thing, then you have different pressure on the two sides. And uh, it looks like it's easier to propagate where you advance it <laughs> than on the other one, which has a negative pressure. But it's, it's a little subtle. Maybe um, I should think about it. There's two parallel plates. It's Safman taylor And then you put the cavity inside. You, you have a cavity and you push with this tube, you push okay. liquid <laughs> inside. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, but you are uh, in 2D and you inflate in the volume. I, I will think about it. I prefer to skip a little longer. So I showed you before that, so I I if your cavity is going to, um, they grow b instead of coalescing, then you get fibrils be between them. Then at some moment, these bubbles will coalesce. They will break walls and then you have individual fibrils. And uh, and then you go to very l you can go to very large stretch. When you go to very large stretch, now you are unconfined. Now you are these fibrils are not anymore under pressure. But then you find again this is these fibrils in adhesives. This is our images by Julian with scanning electron microscope. You see that when you go to very large stretch, you still find this fringes instability now, which Herbert has been showing. And here that's a nice experiment from uh, Morai, a reconstruction of the experiment where he hang a soft solid on the floor. And now it cannot slip, and indeed here it looks like you propagate it, but no, the tripod line is fixed, it's pinned perfectly. There's no fracture there. And due to s elasticity and pressure and unconfinement problem, your system will tend to make this fringe instability when strain is very large. You can see it here, and it's also moving. That's very nice in principle if it moves. Here we are peeling a tape that's a substrate. This is the tape being peeling, and you are uh, stretching, you see here there's no fringes and then as when they are loaded more you see fringes developing and then you see the bonding. This is a hundred microns. I guess. And uh <laughs> so this now leads to this scenario for tack test. So now if you have this soft material between two punches and you expand it, then you first have nucleation. So first you have very stiff material because you are incompressible. It's very difficult to open. Then at some moment, the creation of bubbles will release pressure when one bubble doesn't release a lot of pressure. But when bubbles are close enough to make a dense network, then whew, pressure is really going down. And then after this, you are stretching the fibrils. And all of this results in this plateau where you stretch the fibrils up to the bonding of the fibrils. So that's a scenario of TAC, which is quite different from fracture mechanics, you see. But it's some s similar things. And here you have flow tolerance because you get up here and all your microscopic defects didn't propagate. Okay? So this makes soft solids, which are very soft, they can become very robust uh, adhesives or uh, structural glues because of this kind of blunting of defects and uh, if you can let defects grow uh, uh, without interacting with each other you can have a very robust structure so that's the process. this is displacement controlled process. yeah and um so it's yeah exactly but now i'm starting to trick a little because these things happen with soft viscoelastic material with very, really very soft elastic material it would be very difficult to stretch them so much they would debond because of elastic energy so now since we are just making mental picture we started to have dissipative materials without saying and now we will consider what you have to say uh, anyway that would be the scenario if it was perfectly elastic you would go back I hear if you release, the bubble deflate. 
it depends on the, uh, if it was perfectly elastic it should but this is not perfectly elastic so there's lots of viscous dissipation when you open and then uh, it's going Yeah, th th there's a big difference between when you open and when you close. And the peaks, the peaks will go away. If you, if you actually close the, the, the plateau, it's completely reversed. So if you go back and forth, you get the same. But not the peak. The peak is the peak. Yeah, this is nucleation. It's sort of instability of uh, uh, initial inflation of cavities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now you have a sort of 100 fibrils in parallel, and uh, these fibrils, they are unconfined, so now it's sort of like stretching uniaxially your fibrils, sort of, not exactly. But yeah, a and uh, these materials are very soft, and they, are, they have very, very little amount of cross-links and a lot of entanglements, as you showed yesterday. So indeed, they sort of flow and when they are very stretched, then you feel cross-links and then they debond. But, but you flowing. Yeah, it's entanglement flowing, I think. <laughs> nah, let's not go out of, uh, of, of what I can say. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. <laughs> if I say too fast, I say stupid things. Uh, so now, I put dissipation without saying, now let's think about dissipation. I have maybe yeah, 15 minutes left, so let's just talk about dissipation. And here is more turning to research topic, because most of the answers uh, uh, depend on systems and then depend on what we observed somehow. Then I yeah, yeah, just put motivation of why is it important to study soft dissipative materials. So uh, on one side, there is also a historical reason, which is uh, that yeah, there has been a lot of studies about soft elastic solids, but the people who study viscoelastic material is quite a different community. So th there's a lot of links which are missing. Then people who study viscoelastic materials in fracture, they generally use from many, many years only small strain viscoelasticity. So, uh, or there are other people who study large strain viscoelastic fluids, which are not solid. So there is a important links to be done uh, between these communities and there's lots of good science to be done, we hope. Because these people describe things in a different way. As long as you are soft elastic, you do like Herbert has been showing, you always have Lagrangian approach with the reference uh, unstrained material, which is very clear. When you do large strain viscoelastic fluids, you are in an Eulerian approach, so you are following, you are focusing on a position and you don't care uh, who is coming, who is going through this position. So there's a nice match to be done because uh, sometimes uh, you can treat things one way or the other for a viscoelastic material and there's nice things to be done. But the point is that in material, we work a lot with industrial material which are industrially related, they don't allow to choose one or the other. They generally mix all together. You generally have uh, large strain, viscoelastic and solid uh, together. And uh, there is a strong nonlinear coupling between these kind of things, and essentially you, you are lost somehow. The point is, fracture mechanics, as I told you yesterday, is failing because now you have dissipation everywhere, you have large strain everywhere, so you cannot anymore separate the structure from crack separation. You, you have dissipation a little everywhere. And the point is, <laughs> we don't know anymore how to measure things in one test and predict what happens in another test because dissipation will be different. And then we can even ask, does fractured energy exist ag again if we cannot separate it out? So it's a complex domain. Of course, we can try and get help with this elastodavid length for understanding things, but it's, it's a difficult subject. So let's see something we were trying to do. I showed you yesterday this picture, and let's focus just on viscoelastic case. And yeah, we already told you never see that in reality. And why don't you see that in reality? Is that exactly uh, <laughs> when you're at crack tips, you generally have a blunt crack tip in soft material, like I showed yesterday. And the point is that now, if you see exactly with this sample, which is like that one, now uh, this blunt shape 
will change boundary condition in a region which is larger than the dominance region where you would have the crack singularity from linear relaxation fracture mechanics, okay? So y you will be going from local shape to boundary shape without passing through the singularity, the classical singularity of fracture mechanics. So fracture mechanics as stress singularity approach, the classical one we showed yesterday, is lost. We cannot use it. Then if we keep, uh, generally in these cases, you have, you must focus on this kind of small scale here where you break bonds, where you have this sort of small gamma of breaking bonds, which is uh, the one I was talking about. You have surface energy here. And generally, when you go to large strain in this region, you also have dissipation. But if we forget about dissipation, so no red region, we still can use what we did this morning. Because now we have elasticity, large strains, and if continuum is preserved, so when I propagate a crack, if I, I should not have uh, other cavities um, originating here, just having a single crack which propagates, I can still use Griffith's approach at the way defined by Rivlin and Thomas, uh, which is that you can still make evaluate elastic energy in large strain with all Herbert's equation, and then make derivatives with crack length, okay? And then you know what energy is the released, what work is done, and this work, if you are quasi-static, it's gonna go into the black region for breaking bonds. So what we did yesterday still works if materials are soft, elastic, okay? And there are tools which I didn't do, like J-integral to make calculation. And you still have uh, this concept of elastic blunting at gamma over E, generally, uh, yeah, gamma over E is this elastoadhesive length. So up to here is what we did this morning. Uh, and this can be used, for example, to evaluate uh, elastic strain energy release rate in a pure shear sample, which Herbert has been shown. So if you have this long sample and you and thin and you stretch it, then you essentially can evaluate this density of energy, which for neo is sort of this density of energy, as a function of stretch with no lateral constraint. And now if a crack is propagating, you have a very bad condition here. But the nice thing is that if the system is very long, then on this side you release the energy completely. On that side, suppose it's very long, you still have a, a perfect uh, stretch, uh, pure shear stretch. And now if the crack is moving, no matter what happens here, this is constant. So the difference of energy is you lose one stretched portion and you gain an unstretched portion. So you just have to evaluate the energy uh, of losing for a unit crack length. You lose uh, a strand of stretched material. And this equation gets to a very nice result, which is that the strain energy release rate is just the thickness of your sample <coughs> times the density of energy of stretching the material up to the stretch which you apply, which depends on nonlinear properties. Okay, you can insert strain hardening if you want. And that's a way of using elastic calculation. You can do it if the material is not dissipating everywhere. Okay? Who? Uh, this is the work. In fact, since you stretch. Ah, sorry. Uh, it is the, uh, the initial height of this sample, which means that, for example, if you have a larger sample, then you can have the same uh, G for a smaller stretch. So you will have to stretch less your sample if it's larger. It's the height of the sample times the energy per unit volume which you have in your sample. Okay? That's just a, um, a way to do things. Then. If we go to dissipative system, so now the red region exists and it is generally as large as the large strain region, and maybe you can have some dissipation even elsewhere, then you are bad. And then in this case, uh, so I what I tried is to do something different, which is uh, to say then generally here, if you have this large strain region, okay, because at the scale of this radius, you have large strain. And generally, we try to make measurement of deformation field in this region. 
And inspired by measurements, somehow we saw that globally, yeah, you start from small strain, and then in this large strain region, you increase sort of linearly. You don't go to infinity anymore. You generally end up at sort of finite strain, which is finite strain supportable by, by the network somehow. So you, you go from small strain quite linearly to a sort of finite strain here, and uh, um, which you can measure by this digital image correlation techniques and things like that, which I will maybe show. And now, if this is moving, somehow you will do this strain increase from zero to maximum during the time which you need to cross this region. Okay? That's steady state motion. You can change space in time. So if you let this go through this, you evaluate a strain rate, which is the maximum strain divided the time to cross the process zone, this region with large strain and dissipation. So that's a relevant strain rate. Then you, in this material here, you're essentially having a very large uniaxial stretch of your material here. That's what you observe by kinematics. It's not mechanics. Uh, it's not theory. And then you can look at how your materials behaves in stress strain when you have large strain at a given strain rate, which is the one you measured there. So you measure everything. You don't predict, okay? Because predictions are difficult. So I measure this, and you have these kind of things. And then you measure, you can now measure the area below these curves. And these areas, up to f the maximum strain, are the density of energy for unit volume, which you really inject in this region, and which is dissipated, okay? So now if you get this, W, which is this, like before, this energy as a function of strain. You multiply by volume and you divide by the area. What remains is the size, more or less, of this region, or the width of this region, which would be even better. So this model looks like the previous one, pure shear, but it's different because before now this is the work injected and dissipated, and this is the size of your region which is dissipating. And this somehow gives you a sort of prediction of what would be the energy you lose to propagate the crack through a dissipative material in large strain. That's a very fuzzy stuff, but what we're trying to do is trying to measure, measure, measure many different systems and see, does this describe reality or not? We don't know before doing, okay? So what we are doing is looking to good experimental systems where, by some luck or good choice, I hope, these things are made in such a way that you can really measure these kind of things and provide an answer. And in many cases, you see, the nice thing is that all of these quantities are measurable in principle. So there's no adjustable parameter. So I predict this, then we do it, then either I'm good or I'm wrong. I mean, I, uh, there's no way to trick. Yeah. Uh, and so no, no, uh, that's a big uh, important part, but not really because um, uh, the, the way I see that is that you put this energy in here, then if you unload it, you see how much elastic energy was still there, okay? But this elastic energy was still there, will be used to break the bonds in the black region, so you lose it too. So in the end, all the energy... Yeah, but uh, so the, the, the guess here, you could do more refined models with this, but the guess here, which I find to be not bad in many cases, is that you have sort of two scales. Elast so you can imagine an elastic scale here where you do fracture mechanics. Then when you do here, all the work you send in will be somehow lost. But one part of this is elastic, and it breaks the bonds here. If all of the work were, di work were dissipated here, you would have no energy here, and this fracture would not propagate. Okay? So... That's how I try to do things. And I think that this unloading part is lost. At least I'm looking for a system where this works and, uh, and uh, it's not so bad. Yeah. I want to predict the fracture energy as a function of crack propagation velocity, which is gamma as a function of the velocity of advancement of the crack, gamma of V. In dissipative material, I told you, you have this gamma, which is large and dependent on velocity. I want to predict this based on only measurable quantities, based on description. So I describe this. I see kinematics. 
I measure rheology, I put the two together, I predict the value, is it working or not, with measurements of fracture. Yeah, I can measure the region where I go from small strain to large strain, okay? Yeah, it is difficult, but here I define it differently. It's where I go from small strain to large strain, and I've taken an assumption which is very bad in some cases, which is that energy which goes in is lost, and that is only good for very dissipative materials. Like adhesive, where you stretch fibers, most of energy you send in is lost. But let's see how it... Sorry? Now I show a real measurement, which is really done... I've been doing crap propagation in epoxy resin, and I was measuring fields there, but I'll not speak about... I prefer to speak about peeling because the time is over, it's very fast. With peeling, you take this picture, you cut in half, you cut this, and now you put the backing here and the substrate, and now your red region would be much larger than the size of your system, okay? So that's very bad condition, but that's so bad that things will be easier. Because now you're sort of applying a tax system here, a sort of uniaxial structure, and then you're doing cavities and fibrils here, and uh, you are in all the bad condition where gamma over E is larger than H, is larger than defects, lots of confinement, lots of pressure, okay? And so what we see, it was seen by Kalblis earlier, is that now you're having fibrils and spring, uh, cavities and fibrils there, and it's similar to tack somehow, but it's a moving tack. Okay, so now I can measure a propagation energy, and I will try to model this energy as a function of velocity of propagation. And now the nice thing is, that one is like this, is no more a singularity like uh, the GENS model, now <laughs> you have sort of springs. Okay? And now, in this sort of springs, the good idea came from Gent and Petrich in 89. Now, if you have sort of springs, now you can measure their nonlinear behavior, the stretch is factor 10. Okay? And now you see that linear models would say the same for these three materials. But if you take nonlinear models, and this one is strain hardening, you're breaking here if you put a stress. This one <laughs> will go very far, and this one will flow. Okay? So that's just a picture of how nonlinear properties will enter into this kind of string models, okay? But the criterion of the bonding is still not known, so people use a stress. But uh, I prefer to say I measure it, I measure the strain, and I don't know the criterion, but I put the measurement in my model. So no, I still don't need to predict it. So what we do is a lot of measurement by Richard Villay of peeling. I will not go through the measurement. Then in the, all of this kind, we take a lot of images. We see this region. This is seen from below, very complex strings, fringes, lots of stuff. But we suppose that the more important part is st stretching. And then we use measurement of the flexure of the backing to make analysis of what is the stretch, uh, the stress applied by these fibers and what is the maximum strain. And then somehow the fracture energy is a sort of average stretch of multiplied by the extension. This gives a sort of fracture energy, and now we can measure by these techniques how with velocity fracture energy increases, that's a power law with 0.2, but we can see that the stress is increasing more, and that the stress is increasing like rheology would say. Stress increases with strain rate like linear rheology would say, but the maximum strain is gently decreasing, and this exponent summed to this gives this, this gives a better understanding. It works like a sort of cohesive zone, like uh, you really have an interaction, which goes much beyond atomic interaction. That's why it's very tough. Okay? And then we try to do something more. We measured nonlinear extensional properties by these counter-rotative cylinders, like here, for a series of adhesives which we obtained by 3M with custom rheologists, which had the same linear rheology in the region which we solicited by peeling, but then they are differently crossing, so they would have a very long-term behavior which is different, but they have a clearly different large strain behavior. The one which is more crosslink will strain harden sooner and will debond sooner. Okay? And this, by using this integration of these curves up to the measured value of the strain, we can measure the gamma energy as a function of velocity, and it was no bad for the two tapes which are same linear rheology and different crosslink. We get two different predictions, while all linear models would give same prediction because same ingredient, same output, no matter what the model. 
And we can describe quite well things, except that we have to shift things up by a factor of four, which is not good, but in scaling law is not a big problem. But anyway, the nice thing is that this factor of four is always four. You change experiment, it's always four, okay? And then we're thinking about why is that four? It is four because indeed it's not uniaxial extension. You are drawing fibril from an adhesive. I showed the picture before. Where was it? Yeah, oh, ah, very far away. Ah. You are drawing fibril. This is, this is a bulk material and you're drawing fibril. So it's not just uniaxial extension, but it looks like. There is some prefactor which depends on triaxiality here, and we were trying to simulate. And a partial prediction that we got the right road is that this phenomenon of stringing are due to incompressibility of your material. Okay? Incompressibility makes that you have to make cavities and strings. Now, uh, I show this first. If you take a material which is a sort of foam, this is not happening. Okay? And now, in a material which is a sort of foam, you can expand it without making cavities and strings. And now, if you make this uniaxial measurement, you get no factor of four. So, changing compressibility of your source system is very important. It can, if your system becomes compressible, then you can suppress many shape instabilities, okay? And get something which is more continuum field, but then cavities happen on a small scale, but in an homogeneous way. And something else which we tried is that now, if this is right, it means that in peeling and tack, you can find a match between these two measurements, which generally are very different, by measuring what is the strain rate of these fibrils. You put the same confinement, same strain rate, as the one you apply in a tack test. And indeed, we could measure by these tapes, which have same linear rheology and different strain hardening, we could measure that we can collapse fracture energy of peeling and tack by putting a graph with the same strain rate of fibrils. And also the same stress we can measure stress and strain independently of fibrils, and uh, the stresses are the same, and the strain are the same too. So it's really the same mechanism of the bonding between peeling and tack. And I, I, I'm closing here just by saying that we also studied shear, and uh, we observe cavities, and that's we're trying to understand how what Herbert said about the fact that nonlinear terms in shear will create a negative pressure. This quadratic term which comes out is very bad. It crea can create a negative pressure in, uh, in, uh, in shear. And uh, also we are studying, now we are trying to make fibers in a good order by making patterned substrates uh, and study adhesion on patterned substrates. We have these individual fibers of different sides and study scaling effects. And here we're looking for a postdoc, so <laughs> I want to have this advertisement. We have a new NAR project financed there to keep on doing that. And uh, also, um, then I, I'll be leaving tomorrow, but I will leave you with good company with uh, our student, which has uh, the one working with me, as Vetlana, Akash, and Gabriel, working on cutting soft material, resistance of cosmetics on your lips or, or on your skin, and developing very strong glues so you can keep discussing with them and still discuss with me up to tomorrow. And then I just leave you with some references, where I'm maybe the most important is this review. And these are more recent papers than the review to keep on going. Thank you. <laughs>